Welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement here with Robert Perry. And today we are discussing part two of the senselessness of war. You can download the discussion guide for this at circleofa.org forward slash 16. And hello, Robert. Hi. <laughs> so in our last podcast, you mentioned that Religion, regardless of the form, whether it is Christianity, Islam, Judaism, etc., has been used both to justify war and pacifism. So God will destroy his enemies, but God is also love. And what's interesting and what's so needed in these times is that the Course is unambiguously on the side of peace. That's what we were discussing in, in our last episode. Right. And so much so that there is no pro-war language in the course, and there's even no pro-war imagery. And the feedback that we received from the last episode was that talking about war is a downer, which is true. But if you look at the course closely, I think it provides a cause for hope because the course paints a vision in which the concept of war is so senseless as to be absurd. And it's also painting a vision in which we can become free of the internal conflicts, which lead to so much external destruction and violence. Yeah. And we can become free of the middle term too, which is taking part in the normal daily interpersonal war. Right. at the workplace, in the family, et cetera, et cetera. That middle term, I think, is key. Right, and assuming responsibility for the individual shifts that create collective change. So, so I was just kind of, I know that talking about war is a downer overall, but at the same time, today, we are going to get more into the case for hope and optimism that the course presents. Yeah, we're talking today about how we should respond to war, both the large scale and the small scale versions. Uh, in the previous podcast, we talked about just the course's dissection of war itself, what it says about war. But now we're talking about the hopeful part, how we can respond in a positive way that ultimately brings peace. Right. So where would you like to begin? I think for me, before, I, I have six points that I've gleaned from the course about how to respond to war. And oh, they're okay. both, just, just six this time, <laughs> they're both how to respond to, you know, war out in the world in the conventional sense and war in the normal interpersonal everyday sense. Um, but I think for me, the, the umbrella concept in all of this is the direct personal relevance of war for each of us. Because when the Course talks about war, it's sometimes talking about actual wars between countries, uh, occasionally, but mostly is talking about the war between people. And in that war, we're, we're using mental weapons like judgment it refers to judgment as a sword several times, at least a few times. Um, but it's also talking about behavior by which we wage war interpersonally. Um, and as we said last time, you know, that, that whole small scale war is continuous and one would have to assume ultimately the seed of those large scale wars that are fought with official armies. So we are all taking part in the war that has engulfed this world since the very beginning, and we can make a different choice. So this topic is, is far more relevant for us, I think, than we might assume. Because I hear war and I think, well, something going on in some distant corner of the world, and it has very little to do with me. I don't know anybody that is fighting in that war. I wish it wasn't happening, but how directly relevant is it for me? And yet, 
there are wars raging all the times in our homes and our schools and our businesses, et cetera. Yeah. And, and we have to look at how we take part in them. Like my knee jerk reaction is, well, yeah, they, they're raging. Let's face it. They're going on, but I'm a conscientious objector, right? But I don't think that's very honest. You know, we have our ways. I'm a participant. We have our ways, both mental and behavioral, of taking part in the war. And that's why there's that whole long, amazing section above the battleground in the text. It's not talking about get off that conventional battleground in Afghanistan. You know, how many core students are there? Um, It's talking about the everyday battleground. Right. What you're saying reminds me of the Einstein quote, we're not going to solve our problems at the same level of thinking that created them. And we are so entrenched in our patterns of conflict that we need something like the course. We need some kind of higher wisdom to come in and break up those embedded patterns. Otherwise, we're just going to keep on repeating them with the same results that haven't been so good. And we're going to keep on waging war interpersonally and then looking with shock and horror at the wars out in the world and wondering why our species is so uncivilized. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. We do tend to look at the news and say, gosh, that's so horrible. Meanwhile, we just are emerging from a fight in the morning, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah, we think if I was in charge, that war wouldn't be happening. Right. But we're, we're... we're and engaging we realize, in our own wars. Yeah, we have all these micro conflicts throughout the day. So. Yeah. And that's, okay. as we said last time, I know we could need to get to the points, but you know, it's, it's worth mentioning again that this is how the course began. Helen and Bill were in a state of warfare between each other in their department with other departments and medical centers. It was just a conflict-filled environment, and that's why they wanted to find a better way. So the course is an answer to that daily warfare. I know it, this isn't the most upbeat thing, but, but they couldn't even get over their own interpersonal conflicts to heal their relationship, even though they did have some healing in their department. But I wish they could have been a demonstration of, of true healing on that level, interpersonal healing. That's true. That's true. But apparently the situation with the department was an amazing success story. Yeah. So there's that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look at all the good that came through them. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, sometimes those really core relationships can be the hardest place. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the first point is we can be emotionally immune to war. Doesn't mean we can just not care, but it means we don't have to be deeply affected by it. And what I'm talking about here includes the everyday war that we've been emphasizing so much, but this is specifically about actual wars out in the world. Okay, so in lesson 14, we are meant to pick various disasters out there in the world, like wars and plane crashes, um, and say, God did not create that. We named the disaster. And in the CE, we preserve Helen's original form, which was that God did not create that, something or other like airplane crash in, and we named the location, which I think makes it come alive. And so it is not real. And what I find really fascinating is that um, for the very first example, uh, what Helen originally wrote down didn't have the blanks in it. Um, she wrote out an actual example, which was God did not create the war in Vietnam. And so it is not real. And obviously he's talking about applying that lesson to wars like the war in Vietnam. But for some reason to see that on her notebook page, because this is 1969 when she's taking this down and the war in Vietnam at that point, you know, had engulfed the country. Uh, I don't know. It just always affects me because I don't think I had seriously thought, well, A, God didn't create the war in Vietnam. 
and therefore B, it can't be real. And obviously what that means is, and since it's not real, I don't have to respond to it emotionally as if it was real. Here in the discussion guide, you have pulled out that quote from Helen's notebook. So if anyone wants to see that, you can download it at circleofa.org forward slash 16. As I'm listening to you, though, Robert, when you say we can be emotionally immune to wars and um, the war in Vietnam listed here as an example, I mean, we, 4 million people died in Vietnam. So how do we hold this principle while also not being unsympathetic to true human suffering? I think there's, there's a balance. And actually the next point has a great quote for that balance. There, there needs to be caring for the suffering that's involved. The course wants us to care. Um, there's a great line in, in lesson 191 in the workbook where he says, look about the world and see the suffering there. Is not your heart willing to bring your weary brothers rest? So we're not meant to be like, oh, I don't care about people suffering. I think what we're meant to, to do is abide in two different places at once where we realize ultimately no one's, no one's dying. We're all immortal, we're all eternal. Um, bodies aren't real. I don't have to be uh, upset about the war. And at the same time, we can encompass another place that says, and it does matter that people are feeling pain and people are feeling the separation that comes with death, um, separation from loved ones. And yeah, I think our, we, we need to cultivate a mind that's big enough to encompass both of those things. Mm -hmm. That we care about those who are affected while at the same time holding a metaphysical position of it didn't actually happen and, and they are really were affected. Yeah, right, right. Okay. All right, do you want to move on to point two? Yeah, in just a second, I think that. The idea that, that we can, I mean, a lot of times spiritual people will, will say, well, you know, I just don't watch the news. <laughs> um, and I think it's better, frankly, to be informed and to care while practicing God did not create that war in Afghanistan. And so it is not real. I'm wondering if it could get you to a place where you care more. So you realize that this is a dream and the world is an illusion, but at the same time, while we're here, we have an investment in kindness towards our brother. And so rather than using the teaching as a, as a reason to withdraw, you use the exact same teaching as a uh, justification for leaning in. Hmm. Well, I think maybe the way that we can do that is, is the whole idea of what God did create. He created each person as a priceless, perfect, eternal son of God. So each person Worthy of has, our care. Yes. E each person has limitless worth. And so, of course, they're worthy of our care. So God didn't create the war, but he did create all those beings, those minds that experience themselves in that war and they have limitless value. So yeah, I think that's really, a way to... But if we really had that mentality, we wouldn't go to war in the first place. Not having that is the condition that creates the war. Right. So, but like, since those wars go on, what can we do but bring to them the highest perspective we can? Right. And if enough bring it, then maybe they're is hope for no war someday? Well, I think from the course's standpoint, it's a certainty. It's just a question of how soon it happens. We better get yeah. on the stick. Yeah. Well, and I think we are. I mean, I mean, I think humanity on the level of war is slowly growing up. So you know, I think, it, I think way back when we killed a higher percentage of our population through warfare. 
than we do now? Yeah. Okay. But I don't want to kind of drill us down into that, but if you look at the, the number of wars that have been fought just in the last 150 years, I, I did a stack of them in preparation for this podcast and it is staggering. It is staggering. It is staggering. We went from the Civil War to World War I, 14, 1914 to 1918, right, almost right into World War II, and then Vietnam, Gulf, Bosnia. It just goes on and on and on. We are not learning these lessons. And I think that we're all exhausted by war, and yet at the same time, we seem to be in a perennial state of it. It's true, yeah, but I do think I do think that it is getting better. I mean, there's a great stat that functioning democracies don't go to war with each other. I don't know if that's totally invariable or not. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, the arc bends toward peace, you could say, um, and even though it's a very long one. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> yeah, I made it up a long time ago. <laughs> you and Martin Luther King. <laughs> what? Did he plagiarize me? Actually, actually Ben starts justice. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the second point is we can forgive it. And uh, we have a line in the CE in which Jesus is speaking about the Holocaust in chapter one of the text. And he says, I shed many tears over this, but it is by no means the only time I said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, the Holocaust, the Holocaust was not technically war, but we think of it as part of World War II, which it was. Um, and I just think this is a really, really interesting, it's one sentence, but it says so much. First of all, there's this combination of him saying, on the one hand, he shed many tears over it. And that's a direct quote. Uh, but on the other hand, expressing forgiveness. So even though we can care about the suffering, we can still be in that place that reflects the first point, you know, it's not real, um, in which we forgive. What I also find interesting about it is that, of course, that line he's quoting, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's saying, he said that, during the Holocaust. Um, he also, of course, said that, that's a line from his own crucifixion in the Gospels, I think it's the Gospel of Luke. Um, and what's interesting about that is that he's talking about, you know, Jews being killed by a tyrannical state, Nazi Germany, and in quoting his own line from his own crucifixion, he was a Jew who was being at that moment killed by a tyrannical state. Yeah. You're not really defending your case that we're learning the lessons of history here. <laughs> 2000 years later, we're repeating the same cycle. Yeah. Well, those things still happen, unfortunately. But I think what that says is that there's something really perfectly transferable about the forgiveness he expressed during his crucifixion you know, it's transferable to the Holocaust. Yeah, and I, I know that your objective, our objective here in this podcast is to present course teachings regardless of how uncomfortable they can be. And one of the high watermarks of feedback that we got on the last podcast was how can we be pacifists in the face of rising authoritarian behavior in the world like Jesus, right? So we're on this path because we want to model what Jesus did. And yet what Jesus did was march peacefully to his own crucifixion. And is that what he is asking of us? That's 
where I heard the most um, grumbling sure. about podcasts, the first part one of this series. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I don't know what he's asking of us individually. Um, he says it's not our part to be crucified. Uh, however, imagine, I mean, you know, the, the Gospels report that, that his followers, like Peter, drew a sword to defend him. And he told him to, you know, put a sword down. Um, he quotes that in the course. We have that now in the CE, which is very interesting because all the sword references in the course are negative. Um, it's without exception. Um, <clears throat> so imagine if he had said, hey, Peter, good going. You know, everybody take whatever weapons out that you may have hidden in your tunics and defend me. I don't think we'd even know about him. Right. I personally think it's because of the resurrection that we know about Jesus. We may have had, there may have been, you know, brief historical references, which there were to a couple other, you know, healer, holy men types in his general era who, who didn't write. Um, but without the resurrection, I, I doubt we would have heard of him unless we were historians. Mm, that's a really good point. So, marching to his death willingly, that whole package that happened there at the end, mm -hmm. um, he changed the world by not defending himself. Yeah. What if he had had the mentality of an eye for an eye? You know, he would, I like Gonzi's quote, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And yeah, yeah okay. I'm, I'm with you with that. I mean, we, we look at religion and spirituality to be our moral compass and our moral guides. And if it gets it wrong, then society tends to go off the rails using biblical and Quranic quotes to justify slavery, for example. And here at the heart of a tradition is a peaceful warrior. And that's, that's the wrong kind of mixing language, but, but, his message has survived and that's the force behind it. That's the warrior piece of it. And so we can follow that even and up to our own death. Why not? Model his example. Why not? Why, Why not? not? We, we, we're going to die. <laughs> you know, we're going to die. Uh, well, one, one thing that comes to mind while you're talking is I remember right after nine 11, I saw some late night, maybe it was Nightline, some, some TV show where they had representatives of different faiths, including they had a new age teacher, you know, really prominent new age teacher, spiritual teacher on there. And uh, someone called in from Anaheim, California, where I lived for a long time, um, <clears throat> and said, what role does forgiveness play in this? You know, the, these the people on the show were giving the, they were representatives for the different faith traditions saying what that faith tradition would do, would have us do in response to 9-11. And so somebody brought up forgiveness and they could not leap in fast enough to defuse that bomb. No one, could, no one was willing to stand up for the message of forgiveness in the face of 9-11, because anything else felt weak, submissive, you know, et cetera. And yet, I mean, look at what our strong response yielded. I know right. that history will have to sort that out, but from where I sit, it was a disaster. That's interesting is when you, when you look at something that has happened to an individual, I went to a retreat with the woman, a woman who was in the mm. room for um, the mother Emanuel shooting where her own son was shot and killed right in front of her in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago. And that church was such a demonstration of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness. And, and, and even talking to Felicia one-on-one, -on -one, she was like, I'm, I'm, I forgive him. I wish she was trying to get there, but, but forgiveness was, was the apex for her. But as a country, we're supposed to hit back. So as, as, in terms of getting this message right, like what works for the individual needs to, to make possible for the collective, 
we want to forgive at an individual level, but as a country, if we get offended or attacked, we are supposed to hit back and hit back harder. And those things are disjointed. And if they were more collectively aligned, if we could display forgiveness as a country, then we wouldn't see so much war. I, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, it's we not haven't... It's a value. It's, it's, it's not a collective societal value. And we look at the people that... And there are lots of stories of people who forgive in the face of murder. There was an, a beautiful story about uh, an Amish community where a man killed a, a lot of their school children. Right. Um, and they responded with forgiveness. And it, I feel like ripples of light go out from those examples. But we look at them like, wow, that is beautiful, inspiring. But we almost want to put a little bit of a fence around it. It's an oddity. And of course, we can't do that on any large scale. Because that would be weak. But that, that would be weak. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw an interesting um, uh, thing in, in the wake of Kirk Douglas's death. He had things he wanted the world to, to know and remember. And, and top of the list was that weapons are weak, not strong. Good for him. Yeah. If you live long enough, you, you, these things have to sink in. Like you live long enough, Kurt has seen a lot of war. He has to have seen, gotten the message of the senselessness of it. I think a lot of people get that message. And, and sometimes it's born from the experience of being being in wars. It has to be. You get enough age on you and you see, what are we doing? Yeah. Anyway, what I love about this Holocaust quote is it combines these two qualities that you were kind of crying out for earlier of, of a soft heart. I shed many tears over this, but also a peaceful mind. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I think we can have, we can have both of those poles within us at once. I love your point about Jesus. No one would know who he, who he was if he didn't demonstrate that very teaching. Mm, yeah. Okay. So my next point is the chorus repeatedly says we should lay down our arms. <clears throat> I'll just read some of the quotes here. Um, it's quite striking how often it's said. It talks about in Lesson 136, a mind... Um, that would lay down its arms and cease to play with folly. Notice again, you know, arms, weapons, warfare is equated with folly, not strength. Lay down your arms and only then will you perceive it false. This is lesson 170. I think um, there was conflict. Uh, also, Lesson 170, lay down all defense as merely foolish. Lesson 182, lay down the spear and sword you raise against an enemy without existence. Again, an image of folly. You've got a spear and sword you're raising against an enemy, and that enemy doesn't exist. Lesson 190, lay down your arms and come without defense into the quiet place. And it goes on where God's peace holds all things still at last. Lesson 190 as well. Lay down the cruel sword of judgment that you hold against your throat. Really arresting image of, of again, the use of weapons being not strong and, and brave and noble, but suicidal. And finally, from the manual, section 20, lay down your sword. And it's talking about anger there. So he's just saying again and again, scattered over, you know, a, a great distance in the course, the same thing. And of course, you know, how many of us are carrying actual weapons? I guess in America. A lot of us. <laughs> that, question is, that, that, that question is different than it used to be. Um, but... Uh, He's talking really about the everyday warfare here. You know, the sword of anger, the sword of judgment. You know, our interpersonal defenses and defensiveness. 
Yeah, this reminds me of the part in our discussion last time about not fighting for freedom, but siding with peace. So laying down our weapons, like we think we need to fight to defend ourselves. We need to fight for our own peace of mind. We need to fight for our boundaries, et cetera. And what he asks us to do repeatedly is lay down those weapons, quote unquote, and side with peace. He's asking us to make a choice. Are you going to pick your side, the ego or truth, right? And exactly. And maybe it's strength to side with peace and weakness to side with war. And that was the demonstration of his life. Right. Which I keep coming back to you because I think even through I throughout the first podcast, and, and again, that was the feedback we received, was thinking, yeah, but Jesus died. <laughs> like He was a pacifist right up to the moment of his own death. And then you, real, you think that's weakness. I was judging that. The listeners mm -hmm. were judging that. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, wait a second, it's like just hitting me. That is strange. Well, what comes to my mind is, and I'll let you tell it or not, but a workplace example that you told me about recently, not, you know, workplace that you and I work in, um, but where there was a problematic uh, oh, manager. Yeah. Do you want to, do, do you want to tell what you can of that? Yeah, of course. It's so, a great example. Yeah. This is a example that really meant a lot to me and thanks for bringing it up. So there was a contentious employee who was in a turf war with basically everyone, but and he had his own team, his own team turf, but you just really, really aggressive. He had been a manager for a long time, was used to calling the shots and was in a position where he was no longer making decisions autonomously. And so he had to answer to other people and he wasn't liking it. And he was turning his team sour on the organization as a whole. And the person that I was talking to said that he went to his group, which was at odds with this other manager's group and just said, we're going to try something new. We are not going to win by meeting this other manager at the level of his aggression. We're not going to win an eye for an eye. So what we're going to do is we're going to try something different. We are going to show him and his whole team extreme courtesy, extreme kindness, and we are not going to engage in the petty drama. And he said, I know this is going to take a long time. This is going to take you lifting yourself up above that which you think you're capable of. But I promise you, if you stick with me and trust this process, at the end of the day, you will see results. There is something in other people that finds kindness and courtesy irresistible. So just trust that that's there and that this will work. And it took like six months. But at the end of the day, that manager and by extension, his team changed and the culture is shifting into something that's more collaborative. And it's the direct result of that manager saying to his team, we're going to be better. We're going to bring in some higher wisdom because to the point of what I was saying before, the, the way of thinking that got us into this mess isn't what's going to get, at, get us out of it. And so I love that example. Thanks for letting me share it. It's a great example. And I'll, I'll bet you anything that six months was the fast track. Yeah. Because when you want to do it quicker and do it just by winning the war, you know, those wars end up being stickier and messier than you anticipate and they take longer. Mm -hmm. So that's also an example of not just laying down the weapons, but not fighting for peace, but siding with it and being a model and a demonstration of it. And that creates change. The ripple effect of that. Yeah. Happened. And that is an exact mirror really of Helen and Bill's experience. They decided that if they approached 
their work environment and their department, you know, another way with kindness and cooperation and pointing out the positive and so on, um, they could transform it and they did they transform did. it. Yeah. So it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. To me, it's just a demonstration that it is true. There is something irresistible about kindness in the long run. In the short term, maybe not so much, but, but we are moved by it. Yeah. And it disarms the other person. Okay. So my next point, which is really apropos given your story, is rather than staying on the battleground, we should rise above it and respond with miracles, not murder. And this is the point of the course's longest and most developed discussion of war, which is in Above the Battleground at section four of chapter 23 in the text. <clears throat> and in the CE, it's longer because we've, we've kept the whole discussion together in one section. Um, and basically the story you told is exactly what he has in mind, where you stop trying to you stop staying in the battleground, waging war, and trying to get something out of the war, thinking you can win and the spoils will be yours. Instead, you rise above the battleground, which means you no longer take part in the battle. And instead of responding with murder, you respond with miracles, expressions of love. And what's interesting is as you tell that story, Emily, it's kind of exactly what he's talking about here. There was, you even mentioned rising to a higher place. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know how moved I am by your drawing of the, I mentioned this all the time, <laughs> the problem being our solutions being so close to our problems and the little circle of the solution and the little circle of the problem being right next to each other. And that's where we tend to live. We tend to live from that place where we're just so myopic in our problems that we can't bring in higher wisdom. But the only thing that's really going to create lasting, true change is bringing in that higher wisdom if we can get there. That's exactly what happened in that workplace. And it's exactly what happened with Helen and Bill. And it's what he's talking about here, just getting above the battlefield. Right. So what all of this to me adds up to is maybe that that solution that is so impractical that it's unthinkable and seems suicidal. Maybe it's the only practical solution and maybe the other is impractical and suicidal. Yeah. And what what I learned from from that example, that story of that workplace is that it took a community, it took a collective in order for the individual to have the emotional strength and resilience to rise above. So if left alone, the individual wouldn't have been able to make it. It, it took them saying as a team, we're going to do this. I know it's going to be hard, but trust the process. And it's going to, and they even said, it's going to take a level you hitting a level of emotional maturity that you think you can, but you have to for all of us. Hmm. And so collectively they were able to do something that individually they never could. And what's interesting is that co with war, the same rules apply, but in the opposite collectively, we do such horrible things that individually we never could. Well, do we know that we never could? You know, there's the famous experiment where, where people are, <clears throat> you know, the oh, experiment the, the where, shocking. yeah, yeah, where, where they're, they administer a, a test to somebody who they don't see, although they meet them beforehand. Um, and every time that the person gets a question wrong, they have to deliver um, an electric shock and electric shots get stronger, and stronger until they're in a danger zone um, where it's apparently lethal. And, and that person goes from, you know, ouch to obviously in real pain to begging and screaming, and then they go silent. And I think approximately 60 
or maybe a bit higher percent of people um, take it all the way to the end, just because an experimenter says, please continue the experiment. Right. I think it varies, but you also hear reports of, that's a horrifying experiment. And I know it's very famous. And they can't conduct it anymore ethically. Although I saw Darren Brown, a British mentalist do it and he got similar results. He was just doing a TV show. He wasn't doing a university study. A university can't do that anymore. Right. But you also hear reports from the field of war now where individuals find what they're doing so abhorrent that they have to be drugged in order to be compliant with what their commander is telling them to do. So it's gray. Yeah, we have the impulse for peace and we have the impulse for war. I mean, I read a really interesting piece recently that said that uh, we shouldn't hold up as the solution um, acts of heroism in the face of authoritarian governments that want to like round up your neighbors and kill them. Um, what this said was that there's great personal cost for those acts of heroism and not many people are going to do them. What it said was that those governments, they can't do what they want to do without lots of active cooperation from the populace. So the populace saying, yeah, that neighbor down the street, go get them they're Jewish or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, it requires lots of cooperation from ordinary people, from civil servants to carry out these horrific acts. The answer, according to this article, and I thought that point was really well taken, is just don't actively cooperate with evil. But you don't even have to actively cooperate with it. Your apathy in the face of it can be just as damaging. Yeah, but lots and lots of people do have to actively cooperate with it for it to happen. That was the point of the article. Mm. Wow. Okay. So people are, but... people are, you know, laboring away at their jobs or they're acting as, as responsible citizens and they know they're sending people to their deaths. Mm -hmm. Well, you look at what's going on in governments around the world right now and leaders are being enabled in areas where they should be thwarted. Yeah, right. And enabled by apathy as well as lots of active cooperation, I think. Anyway, to, to get away from that depressing point, um, I, I just think it's remarkable that what the course is asking us to do here, there are real life examples of it all over. I mean, we didn't plan to bring up that example from that workplace. Uh, and it works. And it can be more wise and more practical, more efficient and more strong than going the traditional, I'll be strong and go to war route. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, shall I move on? Yeah. Okay, so... Point number five, this comes up repeatedly in the course. We need to see peace as the underlying reality in this world and in all hearts. I'll read you a couple of quotes about that. This is from chapter 25, section three in the text. He will hear plainly that the calls to war he heard before are really calls to peace. Chapter 31, section one, how wrong are you to f who fail, excuse me, to hear the call that echoes past each seeming call to death, that sings behind each murderous attack and pleads that love restore the dying world. So what both of those are saying is that we hear these calls to war and on the surface, there are calls to war, right? in the home, in the workplace, on the international level. Uh, but what we don't hear is the real content of those calls to war, that, that if we could see and hear accurately, we'd realize there is a call to peace, a call to friendship, um, a, a, a pleading that love restore the dying world. 
I think what we have to imagine is that in each of those people that we see as calling us to war, secretly their deepest desire is for peace and for friendship and for unity. I love this point. And I think it's so important for all of us to truly understand that when we are attacked, that anyone who attacks is asking, as the Course says, for love. And that quote, those who attack are poor, their poverty asks for gifts. So you couldn't attack someone else unless you were feeling in a state of deep lack. And our response to that should be not to attack ourselves, but to recognize that state of lack, have compassion for it, see the peace and the holiness and the innocence and the truth underneath it, and communicate with others to that from our truth to the truth in them. Yeah, to see that what they really, they don't understand what they really want. They think they want war, but they don't realize what they really want is peace and that their efforts, their participation in war ends up destroying their own peace. So can we, I mean, okay, it's great to see that at a distance. Can we see that in the people that we feel at war with in our own lives? Doesn't that feel like the highest form of love, as Jesus demonstrated, to love someone in the face of their attack, regardless of what they do to you or how they feel about you, to love them anyway? Well, yeah, I, I think it's the most beautiful thing in this world. And that's what forgiveness is about in the Course. And that was a major focus in Jesus' teachings 2,000 years ago. Not just loving people, but loving people who are attacking you and acting like, even if they have the upper hand socially, acting like they're the one who's poor. They're the one who's in need. They're the one who's at risk. But doing it in a way that isn't sanctimonious, doing it in a way that is coming right. not from a, a place where you're trying to be above because you're so spiritual, but because you genuinely care about the truth in them. Right. And communicate with them right. at that level. It, it can be a source of spiritual one-upmanship, of course. Mm -hmm. But that's, that would be a distortion of the, of the real teaching. I'd love us to do a podcast at some point on the call for help, call for love idea in the course. I think it's one of the richest ideas and most beautiful in the course. I just think it's not really understood. We could do that next. We could. We could. One more quote on this point. This is from Lesson 57 in the workbook. Uh, it says, when I see the world as a place of freedom, I will realize that it reflects the laws of God instead of the rules which I made, made up for it to obey. I will understand that peace, not war, abides in it. And I will perceive that peace also abides in the hearts of all who share this place with me. So it's one thing to, to say, I mean, the Course is asking us to take an, another kind of dual position that looks like it's too big for one mind to encompass. On the one hand, we need to be honest and, and realize it's a place of war. And every home, every school, every workplace, every town is a battleground. So that's one level. But then we're asked to go down another level and realize underneath that surface war, there is something beneath it that's more real. And that more real thing is peace. So we can see the world as really being a place of peace because there is a spiritual reality and a reality in all hearts of peace, even while we acknowledge that, yes, it's just a jungle out there on the surface. But to the point of this quote, we can bring the laws of God to that jungle and maybe change it. Well, the quote's not about that, although my next point's about that. Um, the quote's just about seeing that the laws of God prevail here, peace prevails here, regardless of what's happening on the surface. Um, I think that's we, the start. How would they prevail if we didn't demonstrate them? Well, they prevail even when they aren't demonstrated by anybody. 
So they prevail because they're the underlying reality. So if you, if you can see with the eyes of vision, you realize that even while those people are engaging in acts of warfare, and even while you hypothetically do nothing to stop it, or while you engage in it, um, still what's more real is the peace they carry deep within. Right. The laws of God don't require our cooperation to be true. Right. Right. So we, I think if we're going to demonstrate something different, it starts with us seeing, okay, that person who looks like my enemy, they've got peace in their hearts and what they want is peace. Even if I perceive them as, as, as asking for war. Um, I think if we start with that perception, we can act in such a way as to diffuse the war. Okay. we move on to your next point. Okay. Having won that round. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Point number six, we can work with Jesus to usher in the time of peace. And he mentions this concept several times. In chapter two, in the text, section three, he says, together, we can then work for the real time of peace, which is eternal. So he wants us to join with him to work for the time of peace in the world. Then lesson 125 in the workbook says, no peace is possible until his word is heard around the world, until your mind in quiet listening accepts the message which the world must hear to usher in the quiet time of peace. So if we quiet our own mind and hear God's word, we can then speak that word in the world um, and help to usher in the quiet time of peace. That may sound kind of pie in the sky, listen to God's word and then it'll speak through you and the message of peace will be heard around the world. But we all have seen examples of that very thing happening. I was listening to um, someone's near-death experience recently, which I've heard, you know, starting probably almost 10 years ago. Um, but it was a new format. It was not a podcast. It's a great experience. And she's told, um, she's given these certain gifts by God, and she's told, um, and when you speak, millions will hear. And I thought, Okay, so she's told us in this NDE, it happened 15 years ago, like, really, millions? And uh, after the podcast, I went to see if she had a website, and, and she does, and she has all these initiatives going, and she's been on the Dr. Oz show, and this, this talk show, and, you know, a few things you'd recognize that probably have a listenership or audience of, of millions. I mean, look at the course, you know? Helen heard God's word, and millions have heard the word that she heard. Yeah, your quote, the next quote that you have here, his voice would give, you, give to you his holy word to spread across the world, the tidings of salvation and the holy time of peace. What this brings up for me is that the pressure is off of us to figure out what we're going to say to those millions of people if we have an audience so vast that our job is really to listen and to not to try and find the words, we'll be given the words and the time in which to speak them. And so we just need to attune to those. And that's part of how we join with Jesus to usher in the time of peace. Yeah, right. I don't have to worry about what to say or, or what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, idea. I was thinking about the truly helpful prayer as well. Yeah, yeah. so... Okay, and one last quote, and then I want to circle back to what you were just saying. Um, this is from the manual. The world will end in peace because it is a place of war. The idea in that section is the ending of the world will be the overturning of all that it has been and all that it began as. So the, the world will end in peace rather than catastrophe. Anyway, I think that the things we were just saying about how we just hear that word, it tells us what to say, and we might reach millions. <clears throat> what that brings up for me is the thing I mentioned at the start, which is this is not a distant topic. This is directly relevant for us, for each one of us, 
because we are all meant to be a force of peace in this world. You know, peace between nations is not just a matter of, you know, armies and diplomats. It's a matter of the consciousness of the populace and the consciousness of the world. And we're all meant to elevate that consciousness, both through small acts that no one ever knows about and through getting up on a talk show and reaching millions of people. Um, all of it is part of the plan to turn the world into a place of peace. I always like that message from Marianne Williamson's presidential campaign where she said this is a season of moral repair. And one of the things that she was asking for is for all of us to take a very serious look in the mirror at our own part and participation in creating the conditions that make war inevitable. And so you had asked me before we hit record, what is it that you feel connected, so connected to this topic around, I didn't articulate that very well, but what is it about this topic that makes me so passionate? And it's, it's that. It's the idea that if we take a look in the mirror at our own individual behaviors and get it right, take a stand for truth versus taking a stand for the ego and taking a stand for our grievances, take a stand for forgiveness, then if we get that right, once again, at the individual level, we cannot help but make that change at the collective level. And that's what's needed in the world today. Absolutely. Yeah. And from the course's standpoint, all those individual thoughts and acts, they ripple out and affect everyone. And they affect specific people across the world that we'll never know about. Yeah. And, so. and if, to your point and to the point of King earlier, if the, the arc is long, but it bends towards justice, then we have been slowly getting it right. It's just going very slow. And the onus is on us to get it right, or we will continue to destroy ourselves and continue to destroy our world. And so we need to really take a look at this and, and, and in our own hearts and see what we can't do to, to make the change in our homes and schools and businesses that will ripple out. Absolutely. And I think it, it does mean facing and admitting how we engage in the war. Like we'll want to tell ourselves, well, I'm not the one engaging in the war. They are. I'm just, you know, acting calmly and reasonably and so on, standing up for truth. Um, but chances are we are engaging in the war. And I think a first step is just admitting to ourselves and admitting that there is no actual line between our little war and those big wars out there. It's all continuous. And that we make a difference either for war or we can make a, a profound difference for peace in a process that has been going on for thousands of years as we slowly climb up out of just brute force and killing and bloodshed to a more civilized world that's going on we're called to contribute to that seems like a good place to end do you have anything else that you want to say i no i don't okay thank you robert this has been really helpful and our next episode we really should talk about the attack as the call for love that'd be great beautiful okay. concept okay all right. See you, see you then. See you then.